Hello and welcome to the American Cinema Foundation Movie Podcast. I am your host, Titus, and today I'm joined by my friend Pete Spiliakos for another, our 12th, I think, conversation. And today we're approaching a very middle-brow subject about movies, storytelling, and politics, about conceptions of authority and heroism. We're talking about Harold Ramis, 80s comedies, Caddyshack, Back to School, and Ghostbusters. First of all, Pete, thanks for joining me. It's a wonderful idea. I'm glad you suggested it. And first of all, let me do a synopsis of the three movies we will be discussing. Caddyshack came out in 1980. It was Harold Ramis' directorial debut after having written a few hits, including, of course, Animal House, the most famous one. And it was the beginning in earnest of Harold Ramis' criticism of American society, or rather of elites. Pitts, Rodney Dangerfield, playing Al Servic, a billionaire real estate developer who is the epitome of vulgarity and brashness, against Judge Elihu Smales, the epitome of wasp respectability. The comedy is essentially a story about breaking down barriers of prejudice. Al Servic notices in one of his many clever aperçus that wasps used to segregate against Jews, against black people, against all sorts of lower class ethnicities. And he indeed bursts in uninvited and unwanted into the Bushwick Golf Club and ends up changing everything there through the chaos he invites ultimately upsetting the hierarchy of wasps who treat the caddies who are all young and somewhat poor as servants. That's an American of course. An old order is going out and the new one is coming in. It's out with the staid, in with the vivacious. Out with the quiet, in with the vulgar and the flamboyant and the loud and the energetic. Democracy is coming to the country club conquering easily with the grace of comedy this redoubt of ancient privileges. Next is Back to School which came out in 1986 and was also a big success. Here Rodney Dangerfield plays another kind of successful businessman. He has in fact made himself a millionaire by owning a nationwide chain of clothes stores for fat people. How lower class and vulgar and demotic is that? Well, he's, in this case, mounting an attack on academia. His son is not getting the best education he should be getting at his pricey Great Lakes University, and so the rich father decides to enroll, and in the process, he shows up the entire school establishment. Again, this is an attack on the wasps and their old proprieties, whether it's deans or frat boys. And again, it is a rude awakening as democracy marches into a redoubt of antiquity. Thornton Mellon has the money to buy his way into the university, and the university wants the money too much to deny him. But he brings with himself not just the money he made, but the wisdom by which he made it. That is to say, a very cynical but practical, get it done attitude to the economy and of course therefore to success in America. With the university and back to school, it's even more obvious than with the country club set in Caddyshack that these are people whose success lies so far behind them in the family tree that they have no idea what goes on and no interest in learning. This makes them unfit stewards of American freedom. This is the theme ultimately in all these movies, the point of mounting a democratic attack on oligarchic institutions from the past is to secure more freedom for more people who had been hitherto disadvantaged or indeed excluded from various precincts of success. So this is not merely an attack on manners and more, as it is also an attack on institutions. And this brings us to 1984, the biggest success, Ghostbusters. Both city politics and the federal government, in this case the EPA, are under attack. In this case, not from a very successful self-made man like the characters played by Rodney Dangerfield, but from a loser who can talk his way into and out of anything, played by Bill Murray, Peter Venkman. There is a further reversal in the storytelling. The successful businessman was himself the assailant and he was bringing democracy to these very expensive, luxurious, elegant retreats of the old rich. 
In Ghostbusters, the city itself is under attack and the legal, political and spiritual authorities have to deal with it somehow, but they prove to be as morally bankrupt and intellectually incompetent as the elites did in the previous movies. In this case, the con man hero is a protector, a defender. Between them, these three movies portray two versions of Harold Ramis's criticism of elites. On the one hand, the old conservative wasp elites, on the other hand, the new political elites, which often include ethnic minorities who come to power in American cities and who are progressive in character, as symbolized ultimately by the Environmental Protection Agency, a typical arm of government enlightenment and progressive or and academic control of society. In all these cases, the purpose of Harold Ramis is to show through rather reprehensible protagonists that our elites are corrupt and that they are not in fact interested, much less capable, of concerning themselves with the public good. These are all very successful movies and their fame and their comic conceits, the shenanigans and hijinks and all that fireworks stuff that comedy revels in, led people to ignore what we are actually being told here. Now, Pete, you're the first guy I hear compare Donald Trump to Rodney Dangerfield and indeed to Bill Murray, and I'm grateful that you brought this up, and I'll let you run away with it now because it's really your baby. Well, thanks, Titus. It's great to be with you. I'm just thinking, I was thinking about Harold Ramis as basically being a prophet of Donald Trump. Harold Ramis's comedies, especially from 80 to 86, have a very interesting relationship to authority, to propriety, where basically authority and propriety are fake. They're corrupt. And the heroes of these stories, the protagonists, are people who would not conventionally be likable people. But we like them because they confront these authorities and proprieties that are either hollow or hypocritical. You see this in Caddyshack, where Al Zervik is a loudmouth jerk, belligerent, who insults people constantly. But we're also supposed to find it amusing because he insults people, but if they insult him back, he likes it. But Al Zervik is a self-made man who goes into this Bushwood country club where you have all these pompous people who don't really seem to do very much and don't seem to have accomplished very much. And he insults them and they're very... They're very upset. And if you look at Donald Trump's speaking style, he comes across a lot like Rodney Dangerfield. He comes across a lot like Don Rickles. And, but the character that Al Zervik is playing is he's a self-made millionaire who got things done, confronting a bunch of people who have privilege and who have authority and who have these codes of conduct who don't really do anything, who are mediocre and who are touchy and who are ultimately incompetent. And Donald Trump, to a large extent, plays a very similar role in public life. Now, he's not really Al Zervik. Al Zervik was self-made, and Donald Trump really was born to a millionaire, and he really did have a lot of advantages. But his public persona is that of the crude guy who gets things done. And he casts his critics as being pompous people who have had privilege, who have learned to manipulate the system, but did so in a way where they didn't really accomplish very much. And one of the taunts about Donald Trump is that, you know, he's the guy who's got his name on a lot of buildings. And, you know, you have a lot of people on social media criticizing him. Well, he's gone bankrupt a whole bunch of times. Well, for a guy who's gone bankrupt a whole bunch of times, he sure has his name on a lot of things. And that's got a certain value to a lot of people in the public. Now, personally, I'm still anti-Trump. I'm going to stay anti-Trump because, you know, if I think that the Democrats were wrong for supporting sleazy guys like Ted Kennedy and Bill Clinton, it can't suddenly become right for me to support Donald Trump. So that, that's going to be my standard. But you can see the appeal of the guy who got things done, who's crude, versus the sophisticated or pseudo-sophisticated people who don't get things done, who did nothing, who are actually hypocrites. And you see the same thing in Back to School, where it's contrasting Donald Trump not to the country club wasp set, but to academia. And this also casts into light the questions about Donald Trump's ethics, where politicians who were glad to take his money when he was a donor suddenly find him a leper when he enters electoral politics. And there's a scene with Rodney Dangerfield and his professor, and Rodney Dangerfield is explaining all the corners you have to cut in order to build anything. And the professor said, that's not how we learn to do things here. And then he tries to change the subject. So where should we build our factory? And Rodney says, how about in fantasy land? And the audience laughs. And the thing is, the criticisms of Donald Trump's ethics to a lot of people sound exactly like that. 
In other words, people who were glad to tolerate sophisticated corruption, people who were glad to tolerate slick corruption, people who might actually be corrupt themselves are suddenly becoming moralistic about Donald Trump. They find it a combination of either fraudulence or naivete. If you're naive, you shouldn't be making these decisions. If you're fraudulent, your accusations have no particular purchase. So you can actually see where both these Rodney Dangerfield characters are presaging the appeal of Donald Trump, the coarse guy who gets things done. And it also reflects Harold Ramis's attitudes towards a lot of institutions that you can't count on these institutions, that these institutions have glamour, but they don't actually value success. They don't value honesty. They only value certain external forms. And you see this in Caddyshack, you see this in Back to School, you see this in Ghostbusters, most of all. But this is not an entirely healthy development. Donald Trump becoming president can't be an, an entirely healthy development. But the uh, political graduate student, Adam Elkus, you think you know him on, you see him on Twitter every once in a while. He said, you know, one of the problems with democracy is when you get too much cynicism. Well, those Harold Ramis movies from the 80s are deeply, deeply cynical about everything. I think a lot of people were okay with Caddyshack being cynical about upper middle class wasps. A lot of those same people are not nearly as okay with Ghostbusters being cynical about the environmental protection agencies. How dare you be cynical about the environmental? These these are these are good people doing good things. How do you they're not like a doctor or a judge? They're they're bad. They're they're good. But there are aspects of the same attitudes towards authority. And that attitude towards authority that devalued country club wasps, that devalued the EPA, that devalued academia, and actually had some good points to be made about all of them, that attitude gave Donald Trump an opening in politics where he basically was able to craft a persona that a lot of people found credible because he embodied a critique of institutions and personality types that they had been watching for decades. Yeah, I think that's all very true. And it's important to see that Roddy Dangerfield was so funny in these movies because he constantly brought out how hypocritical authoritative figures are and institutionally authoritative figures above all. Again, compare that to Donald Trump. The thing that was supposed to destroy his career as a budding politician was the Access Hollywood tape. Now, who has done more monstrous things to women? Donald Trump or Hollywood? And that's a problem. Who's really evil to women, journalists or Donald Trump? To look at some of the accusations that have come out of Me Too, it turns out that a lot of people in journalism, just like a lot of people in politics, just like a lot of people in Hollywood, are monsters. And there's been a lot of hiding things for them because they had the benefit of institutionalized power. And you can also look at it nowadays. It's been two years of Access Hollywood and Me Too. And not a lot of people have been destroyed. Some big names, but mostly people who are over the hill. We went from generalized Me Too hysteria to, it turns out, no. They can't really destroy corrupt men who have humiliated or attacked or raped women. Some for decades. So it really is hard from a democratic point of view to believe in the authority of institutions that are so corrupt on deep moral issues. And I agree that cynicism in a democracy is always a problem because people cannot rule, but they cannot be satisfied to be ruled by people they considered hypocrites, by people that is to say who abuse power, and above all, people who are no better than me. That's what Rodney Dangerfield shows in these stories. One-on-one, -on -one, in small groups, it's hard to say who's better. Admittedly, he brings out the worst in people. He humiliates these wasps and gets them to lose their minds, and once their dignity is attacked, they react hysterically. That's all true, and he's bad news, but he didn't put the nastiness into them. It was always there. It wasn't obvious while they felt their prestige was unimpeachable while they thought they were unassailable. Afterwards, they get really, really nasty, and that's supposed to reveal something. Partly, it's supposed to reveal that under the skin, we're all the same. Under our social privileges, we're all the same, and these people are no better than us. That's a very democratic attack on oligarchic institutions. And you can see this in Caddyshack. Wherever he goes, he strews money in his wake. He tips everybody, whereas all the wasps in the movie, whenever they throw chump change at kids who are caddying there, who are all lower class and pent up hormonally, they're stingy about it, they're humiliating about it. You can see that there's a democratic thing brewing, and it's been coming in America for a while, of course, in stages. The best song on the soundtrack is early in the movie, it's Eddie Cochran, Summertime Blues. 
that has been the anthem of rock revolution in America for more than 60 years. It's a young man who's sick of the institutions of parenthood, of work, the boss, the local politician, everything, because they always hold him down. They never give him enough money to have fun. And so the morality of Rodney Dangerfield who ends up saying, we'll all get laid, is much more palatable when people cannot find good moral arguments, compelling moral arguments to believe that their institutions are justified in keeping them down to some extent, in denying them their desires to some extent. And here's another thing from Caddyshack that has proved prophetic. One day, the guy who runs the caddies, because of course the wealthy country club people don't deal with them directly, there's somebody who has to run them, says, look, you either behave yourself or you'll be replaced with golf carts, which I guess to a large extent has happened. You know, how is that for automation as an upper class attack on the lower classes? <laughs> it's the only way these kids can make money and they're threatened with it being taken away from them. Because they can't behave themselves, because they're rowdy, because they have fights, because they don't have the morals and the manners of the upper classes. Now, there's a lot of truth to that, of course. And there is a lot of ugliness to Donald Trump and what he has brought into politics. But if you ask yourself on a prudential level, who's going to win in America? Institutions and their prestige and their manners or the people? I bet the people win every time. It's a democracy. And that's, to a large extent, what's being announced in these stories. You have got to really rethink what authority is going to look like. If you think you can use your breeding and your past and the prestige of certain institutions, or, you know, networks, as we say, to keep you on top of the world, it's not going to work out. It's just not going to work out, because in America, sooner or later, somebody shows up, with a revolutionary slogan, and it might be healthcare, it might be we're all gonna get laid, or it might be make America great again, but they're all about telling people you don't actually have to put up with all these hypocrites. They're not delivering on the bottom line, and they're not delivering because they don't really care about you. What these people serve to show in their comic way is the large extent to which institutional authority is creating class contempt in the people who hold it who really do look at the rest of the people with nothing but contempt. And that's no way to administer power in a democracy. You will lose your office and worse if people end up thinking that you hold them in contempt, that you don't even think they deserve to have a voice, consent of the governed in politics, or indeed maybe you're even too good for them. The bitterness and the misery we see with a lot of criticism of Trump is a lot to do with that. People who realize that they're not in power, they're not in charge anymore, that they're losing every prestige they once had. They're learning that glamour isn't the same thing as power. And they're not taking it kindly. They're not taking it well. They're not trying to persuade the people that they have something worthwhile to offer. And of course, they're never contrite about anything bad they might have done. It's only somebody else's sins that are on the agenda for discussion. And I think that's really important for Trump because, by all rights, the Access Hollywood tape should have been the end. I mean, his own party should have forced him out. If he, they hadn't forced him out, he should have lost 45, 48, 49 states. It should have been a 1972 or 1964 style landslide. But what did Donald Trump say when he was confronted with the Access Hollywood tape? In his own completely shameless, sociopathic way. He's not a good guy. But what did he say? He says, I've heard Bill Clinton say worse things on the golf course. Now, honestly, Trump is a shameless liar. Who doubts him? Who actually thinks to themselves, you know what? Bill Clinton would never have said anything that bad. And if you say you think Bill Clinton would never have said anything that bad, you're a liar too. And what did he do at the debate? He brought the women who have alleged that Bill Clinton sexually harassed or sexually assaulted or raped them. And the response was, well, we're not talking about that right now. That's not about right now. And when we were talking about that, these same people were saying, well, it's time to move on. And what these really are, is these are assertions of privilege, that we decide when these things matter. And we've decided that, you know, Bill Clinton allegedly raping a woman doesn't matter. And you have to acquiesce to our not caring, because if we don't care, then it's not important, because we decide what's important. And Donald Trump said, no, you don't get to decide what's important. Everyone gets to decide what's important. I get to decide what's important. People at home get to decide what's important. And an element of that is a shamelessness, because Donald Trump really did say those things in the Access Hollywood tape. And these are really are shameful things to say. And he was saying them casually to strangers, which is, I think, extremely bizarre behavior. But at the same time, he was saying these outrages are hypocritical. These rages are opportunistic by elites that feel threatened. And he didn't just do it towards Democratic elites. 
when Lindsey Graham said that Trump was a dirtbag and he wanted nothing to do with him and nobody should want anything to do with him, what did Donald Trump do? He released Lindsey Graham's cell phone number because he had Lindsey Graham's cell phone number because Lindsey Graham would call him to beg for money. So what are we to make of Lindsey Graham's moralism? You know, it's opportunistic. Lindsey Graham had a comfortable place in politics and he comfortably understood politics and Donald Trump was upsetting that. He was overturning his comfortable place in politics and that was bad. It wasn't Donald Trump that was bad. It was Donald Trump being disruptive that was bad. And I think that is part of what weakens institutions, that if institutions are going to uphold norms, they have to uphold the norms. They can't just pretend to uphold the norms. And that's with Harold Ramis's 1980s comedies, it's over and over again, institutions who are projecting themselves in one way, and it's revealing that they're not that way at all. It could be WASP Protestantism. It could be the country club establishment. It could be academia. It could be the Environmental Protection Agency. It could be the Catholic Church. It could be New York municipal government. All of these institutions are revealed to be cynical, to be hollowed. Well, let's move on to Peter Venkman and Ghostbusters. I think Peter Venkman's a really interesting character because Peter Venkman, as we introduce him, is a really bad guy. And in fact, when we first meet Peter Venkman, he's running a fraudulent test in order to have sex with a girl. I mean, there's like three or four layers of misbehavior in his actions. But watch it again. These are exactly the kind of scams that Donald Trump ran. But this is Trump University only at a real university. I mean, Trump is actually the, exactly the kind of con man that Peter Venkman is. But at the same time, I don't think it's fair to look at Peter Venkman as primarily a con man because a con man is trying to fool people. And Peter Venkman in most of the movie is not trying to fool people. He is being oily and insincere all through the movie, but he's not being insincere in a way that the other characters are supposed to be fooled. He's supposed to be insincere in a way that the other characters catch on, that he understands that they're frauds. When he's being superficially polite to Peck at the Ghostbusters office, what he's really saying is, I know that you're not here for anything good. I know you're here in order to shut me down, and I'm not going to let you do it. When he's talking to the mayor and the uh, Cardinal Archbishop of New York, you know, what does he say to the mayor of New York? Does he say to the mayor of New York, people's lives are on the line and it's we have to save him and we can save him, so you have to listen to us? That's not what he says. What he says is, Lenny, you will have saved the lives of millions of registered voters. What Peter Frankman does is, through the use of smarm, through the use of fake ingratiating attitude, He's revealing that these elites are really not any better than Peter Venkman. He does the same thing when he meets um, the guy who wants to date Dana. When Dana is leaving her work and there's the guy who's complaining about the composer, what does Venkman do? Venkman, without ever using the words, just finds various ways of calling him a coke addict. Part of it is you have to understand 1980s culture. Everything that Peter Venkman is saying about the guy is saying that you're on cocaine. I know you're on cocaine. That's why you're so skinny. That's why you're so ed- that's why you're so edgy. That's why your face looks like it's collapsing itself. You're a cokehead. But he never actually says that. Even with his sarcasm, he is being honest. And I think a lot of that comes back to Trump, that his obvious dishonesty is less repulsive to a lot of people than the sanctimonious hypocrisy of other politicians. Like when Donald Trump says, you know, I'm the greatest president ever, I gave myself an A plus, people understand that it's hyperbole. That on some level, even he doesn't understand, and they discount it. When Hillary Clinton says, I've dedicated my whole life to fighting for the powerless, I mean, we're just supposed to take that? Who actually believes this? And the thing is, on some level, what I think makes it more disgusting about Hillary Clinton is that she actually believes, she expects you to take that at face value. And if you don't take that at face value, you're the bad guy, even though she's obviously lying. Whereas Donald Trump kind of understands that we're all in on the con. Whereas with Hillary Clinton, she expects the mark to be entirely sincere in a way that he doesn't. Yeah, that's a very good point. And these are two modes of comedy. In the case of Rodney Dangerfield, he's a guy bursting through your door, coming to your country club, coming to your university to prove, first of all, that his money is at least as good as yours. And secondly, that the wealthy, the successful, the privileged are not actually very well shielded that they don't know how to protect themselves from the people. And the fact that he's forever leading parties and mobs and trying to humiliate people shows that he understands in America the majority wins. The people win and the people will come for all these hypocritical guys. And the problem, of course, is that in America everybody seems to believe that hypocrisy is the worst sin. And above all, the hypocrisy of people in authority. Whenever things go bad, blaming people in authority just goes with the territory. 
But of course, people who are willing to be celebrated for their greatness when things were good are going to have to take the blame later when things aren't good anymore. It's just inevitable. It's not fully fair or just either way, but it is inevitable. And on the other hand, you got this other Bill Murray character who, as you put it, is not actually as confrontational and he's not looking to take over the institutions. But he does reveal that he knows that they're all bullshitting, that their pretense of authority is not something they themselves believe. They want to exercise the power, but they don't want to put in the work to earn it or to deserve well of the people they supposedly rule or represent. They think of themselves as essentially, again, insulated from the powerless. And so this is a strange character that we think of as the demagogue, essentially. Like the few, the elites, he wants power. But like the many, he looks at them from below, very skeptical of their moral claims. And you could say that the problem that was embodied in these movies, whether it's the EPA, the Progressive Crusaders, or the Wasps, the old-time respectable people, is they want to believe and they want to make you believe that power and morality are more or less the same, at least in their hands. That everybody in power deserves to be there, and by implication, that those of us who aren't in power deserve not to be in power. And, of course, that's just not a proposition that people readily accede to. They might put up with it when times are good, because who wants to quarrel with good times? <laughs> but they're not going to hold long term, and they're not a basis of legitimacy for times of crisis. In times of crisis, people become very, very willing to say, like Peter Venkman, like Al Tzarek, you know, how serious are these people really? How much of the nitty-gritty do they have to face? Whenever they ask for shared sacrifice, what is their part in it? That's the problem that these comedies announce, the kind of revolutionary takeover by democracy of certain institutions. First of all, the question is, who gets to decide who's respectable? Who gets to decide who's above suspicion, who's above criticism? Who has to be deferred to? It is no longer the case that the people up top are really in charge. It is no longer the case that people who have institutional authority simply are obeyed by the people. That mid-century era, where every big institution had great credibility and every poll told you that Americans love big government, but they also love big capital, but they also love big labor. They just want to be managed by, you know, a superior class. It's over. From now on, the people will get angry now and then at institutions and destroy their overseers or the institutions wholesale. There is no longer any democratic legitimacy in this idea of being up top or being in charge even. And that's really the power of these comedies. It's true that they are morally dangerous on the one hand because they promote cynicism about America and on the other hand because they encourage instant gratification, I guess is what we call it. But prudentially they work. Politically they're pretty wise because they're saying the only thing you can rely on in America is the good character of the people. And maybe that good character only shows up in moments of crisis in this negative form, skepticism and even cynicism about fake authority, about what we call fake news. But that's something you can rely on because people will get angry at institutions that try to sucker them. As the old American phrase has it, don't piss down my leg and tell me it's raining. That's what nobody in America can tolerate. That's why we hate hypocrisy in the powerful. We don't want to be played for suckers. It's one thing, you know, are you really successful? Are you all you wanted to be? Are you as happy as all that? It's a completely other thing to say that you have to blame yourself only for how things are and praise people who are in power. It's a comedy that announces a time of reckoning, really. There's two sides to these stories, because I think Peter Venkman and Al Zervik are two different sides of a coin, and they both prepare us for Trump in different ways. I mean, whereas Venkman is simply a trickster, and a trickster isn't necessarily a deceiver. A trickster doesn't necessarily fool you. A trickster also uses comedy to reveal truths. And when they're in the mayor's office, how does Peter Venkman relate to people in authority? We see the archbishop greeting the mayor and... Ivan Reitman doesn't usually announce the ethnicities of his people. He never announces that Zervik is Jewish. The mayor is coded to be Jewish, because at that point, the mayor of New York had been Jewish for 10 years, and Ed Koss had just gotten reelected to another term. So, And he kisses the cardinal's hand. But what did he say? Hey, Lenny, how you doing, Mike? 
They're just guys. And how does Peter Venkman address them? At one point, the Cardinal Archbishop, he punts. What's going on? He goes, I think it's a sign from God, but don't quote me on that. And Peter says, good idea, Mike. And then when he addresses the mayor, like we talked about, he says, Lenny. Every time he talks to them, he's addressing them as equals. Because morally, they are. Peter Venkman is a con man. And he sees them as being just as fraudulent. And at the end of that scene, they agree. Because what happens? The Cardinal Archbishop nods to Lenny, and then Lenny nods to Peter Venkman. They're all on the same plane. They're all con artists in their own way. Never mind Peck, because Peck actually believes in his own authority. Peck actually believes his own BS, whereas Lenny and Mike don't. But then you look at Al Zervik. Al Zervik embodies another myth. That is the guy who gets things done. He's not simply a trickster. You would not actually hire Peter Venkman to be president, because he would do a lousy job. You might hire Al Zervik, you know, because he would actually, if you want, he would actually build a wall on my truck. I think is he would actually get a health care plan under Trump. What does Al Zervik say when they threaten to boot him out of Bushwood? I never wanted to be part of Bushwood. I've just been scouting the place to knock it over and build condos. He's much more successful than any of these people. He's above them, even though they don't know it. And that was one of the appeals of Donald Trump, that basically these people in politics are hacks who never really accomplished anything. They only tunneled their way into bureaucracies. The Clinton initiative is just a scam in which people buy influence at the White House. These institutions are real fraudulent. Donald Trump held out the prospect of a guy who had done real things, build golf courses that people had golfed at. He had built casinos that people had gambled at. He built hotels and apartment buildings where people lived in. And this was real in the same way that Al Zervik's successes were real and Judge Smales' successes, whatever they were, weren't real. And I think that was part of his appeal. Now, is there something really mythological about Trump's appeal on that level? Definitely. There's also an element of truth to it. And no amount of criticizing Trump for going out of business can hide the truth that there's a lot of Trump-branded places out there. There's a lot of places that he's built or gotten built where people have lived and gambled and done everything else. And Lindsey Graham can't say that. And Hillary Clinton can't say that. John Kasich can't say that. And he didn't do this with government money, although some, he somewhat did. But with, there's an element of reality to Donald Trump, an element of prudence to Donald Trump that a lot of people found convincing. And a lot of that is what made his candidacy plausible, where against all experiences, it should not have been plausible. Against all previous experience, this should have been a joke. But he was able to appeal to both the trickster's tendency to bring down the powerful to expose hypocrisy and the self-made man, industrialist builder's mythology of actually getting things done. And by appealing to these archetypes, he was able to bring in a lot of people. And also, people criticize Donald Trump. You know, he's a millionaire. How is he going to understand you? Well, you look at Caddyshack. Who does Al Zervik get along best with? He gets along best with the caddies. And what caddy does he get along with the best? Not even the protagonist, not the red-haired Irish kid. He gets along best with the Italian caddy. And what they do is they just trade ethnic insults with each other because they can both take it and they both understand that one of them is rich and one of them isn't, but at the end of the day, they're just people and it's okay. And I think a lot of wage earners who had voted Obama in 2008 and 2012, they got that same vibe out of Donald Trump that, you know, he's just a guy. He's got a lot of the same dreams I do. He's just normal, whereas Hillary Clinton and a lot of politicians, not just Hillary Clinton, but a lot of politicians, you know, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, everybody really except Bernie Sanders, they were just looking down on me. And why would, what, they're less accomplished than this guy, and they're looking down on me, whereas this guy's kind of on the same level as I am. Because he affects a plebeian style, whereas the other politicians are very correct. But at the same time, their correctitude, their propriety, it's just for show. At the end of the day, they're just as fraudulent as he is. In fact, they're more fraudulent than he is because he's not even trying to hide it. Yeah, I think it's important to see to what extent comedy and now our shocking politics both announce why demagogy is happening. Our institutions aren't really credible and the people in charge of them aren't bending their backs to prove their credibility anew in time of crisis. They're reacting with outrage, some of which is fake. It's shocked, shocked that gambling would be going on in this institution, just like in Casablanca. And you don't know which part is honest and outrage and which part is feigned necessarily, but you see people desperately trying to use whatever authority they think they have to hold back a movement that's not really going to be held back. There's no return to a more aristocratic, more well-mannered thing that we code as looking presidential, that we code as gravitas, that you have to look good in a suit and a podium, talk well, be glib, get the right sound bites on the campaign trail. That's not how it's going to work.
it doesn't necessarily matter if you spellbind the journalists covering you or whatever. And that's strangely to the good, there's much less bullshit, there's much less of the circus of respectability that our politics has been defined as, and it's also dangerous, really, because what do you get then? If you examine our institutions, how many of them will be popular? The more they are examined, so to speak, that is to say they come in the fire of partisan polemics, more and more of these institutions, now including the FBI, are highly partisan, they become sort of unpopular, they're not trusted implicitly by the public, and no government can function if it is not trusted implicitly. There is no place in this world where, say, the police can enforce the laws. The citizens enforce the laws. By not breaking them, I mean. If everybody up and committed some minor infraction, every police force everywhere would be swamped in perpetuity. What happens when you unleash popular passions? What happens when a demagogue comes along and says, these people are all corrupt? Am I putting my name on things? Everybody's putting their names on things. Don't politicians want to name every goddamn thing after themselves? Don't the Clintons put their names on things? Doesn't everybody take in money through foundations that are deeply suspected the best of times? And they always hide it moralistically under the pretense that they're saints, that they're our saviors. But they're not, they're only saving themselves. And people are ready for that kind of message because they're not really in love with the various institutions and the various political actors and just public figures that used to ooze respectability. And that's not likely to change. In a way, it's strange how long it took to get from the anti-establishment comedies of the 70s to the anti-establishment politics of our decade. It's a 40-year delay, almost, but you can see that it was all going to come because democracy is taking its revenge on institutions that are beginning to look obsolete and oligarchic at the same time. They have the pretense that they are the best, the aristocrats, the ones who deserve to rule us, and they're kind of saying that they should rule us without our consent. How popular is that going to be as a proposition in any democratic society? Well, there's also institutions that, one, you could you could get some of this respect back by actually being worthy of it. You know, you say what you want about George Bush, who just died. He really did risk all the privilege that he had in order to serve in the military, and not to serve in the rear echelon, but to serve in combat. And he almost got killed. I mean, it's part of what Ross Douthat's column on the WASP aristocracy was that in the middle years of the 20th century, this WASP aristocracy understood that their privilege and the deference that they got was contingent on service was contingent on self-denial, was contingent on the reality of virtue, not just the projection of virtue. Now, this this had been lost even before Harold Ramis was making comedies. Now, there's a lot of things I like about George W. Bush, but he's not the man his dad was, in ways both good and bad. He didn't live a life of service in the way that his dad did in his teens and 20s. And that shows up. And that kind of, I mean, when you look at Harold Ramis looking at the wasp aristocracy as being degenerate, kind of talking about Jeb Bush. And when Ross Douthat is looking at self-seeking meritocracy, you can look at the Clintons who have been grifters their entire career. Now, there's a lot of things I think Bill Clinton got right. I don't think he's entirely a monster. But Bill Clinton has lived a life of profound, total, constant selfishness. But at the same time, Bill Clinton projects a external of, okay, I've made a lot of mistakes, but I'm actually a good guy. Well, actually, you're not a good guy. You've managed to put your talents and vices in service of the public in certain cases, and that kind of worked out okay for people every once in a while. But don't get moralistic about it. I mean, that was one of the absurdities of the 2016 campaign, where the Clintons ran a where is the outrage campaign against Donald Trump. How can we elect somewhat of low moral character president? I don't know, Bill. It's a mystery. How can we do? How can we? How can we do? <laughs> yeah. So that's the problem. That the 2016 campaign, one party ended up with Donald Trump, and the other one with Bill Clinton's wife, and Bill Clinton giving a 40-minute speech at the convention. You couldn't hide him somewhere. You had to broadcast your pride in him. You got to put up the flag for the Clintons. Even now, turns out the answer to that is yes. So you can see in these candidates the hypocrisy of both parties and of both political establishments, so to speak. And really, how is this going to change? How are these people, how are these institutions going to say everything we expected to have, future privilege, not present privilege, is going away? We should make the best of things, we should be contrite, we should make our apologies and above all change and try to do things the people actually approve of. That's not likely to happen. 
the whole point of the charm of demagogy in comedy is that deep down we all know that the people who run these institutions are not our friends and they're not going to change into our friends by being censured, by being tut-tutted, by being criticized. In fact, they don't allow criticism of themselves. Which is actually unfortunate because as Adam Elkis pointed out, if you don't have a rebuilding of trust, if you have cynicism all the way down, Donald Trump is not the worst you're going to get on either side. So unless elites can credibly argue that they are living some of the virtues that they're claiming, Donald Trump's a bad symptom. He's not a good symptom. He's not a corrective. He is at best a warning. But is, is it a warning that either side is willing to learn? Because Harold Ramis's movies don't offer a practical alternative. At the end of Caddyshack, we're stuck with Rodney Dangerfield, whose big moral message is we're all going to get laid. At the end of Ghostbusters, Peter Venkman's still Peter Venkman. You wouldn't want Peter Venkman to be mayor. So where do you go? And the answer isn't going to be found in those. The answer is going to be found in either politicians do learn or they don't. Now, right now, I think most Democratic elites are bipolar at this point. When it looks like they're winning, they're like, ha, emerging Democratic majority and demographics mean we're going to win. And then when they lose, they go, we was robbed. We was robbed. Russia stole it. Facebook stole it. Everybody stole it. So they're not willing to acknowledge any kind of legitimacy to any form of opposition. Anything that gets in their way is cheating. Whereas on the other hand, the Republican elites are just using Trump to get as much as they can. It's a smash and grab operation until he loses re-election. And then when he loses re-election, they're going to blame losing re-election on him. And they're, they're going to do the exact same stuff they wanted to do before Trump came along. They have learned nothing. They're pure Bourbons. You can already see them laying the groundwork after the Republicans lost the House of Reps. They're just thinking to themselves, OK, how can we blame everything that happens on Trump? And then we'll come back with more up higher earner tax cuts, more Social Security cuts, more low skill guest worker programs. And we're going to say that's the answer. They're just going to rewrite. They're going to cross out the old dates in the autopsy after 2012. And they're just going to write in new dates. And they're going to say, oh, but we figured it out. And it's really, really discouraging because you have elites on one side who have given up on the idea of real opposition who have decided that they are entitled to rule, that history has promised them that they're going to rule, fate has promised them they're going to rule, and anything that they screw up is not their fault. They're not going to take any responsibility for any bad thing that happens. And on the other side, you have these people who are reagan era nostalgics who are just desperate. They want, they want to do the 1980s again, only not the 1980s as it happened. They want to do the 1980s distorted through their own present privileges and obsessions and priorities. And they're not going to change. And I don't know what's going to change it. I mean, I, on the Republican side, you might actually need cohort replacement. The problem is Trumpites can't replace Republican establishment because the Trumpites are a bunch of grifters. They're the kind of people that the political system ignored, not because the political system overlooked talent, but because the political system recognized them as being too obvious con artists, even for them. So it's not going to come out of Trump circles. So how are you going, how are you going to have co cohort replacement among center-right elites? I don't know. How much does the center-left have to lose before they learn that they're going to have to learn prudence and tolerance? In other words, in order to be a genuine elite, they can't actually operate with wrathful hubris. They have to be more inviting to elements of people who are somewhat different from themselves. They have to be more like Barack Obama and less like Hillary Clinton. I don't know. And until elites on both sides learn that they have to earn the respect of the public back, that the contempt that Trump heaps on them is in some sense deserved, and they should learn from the chastisement and be better, as opposed to just taking it personally and saying, not me, you can see things getting uglier and uglier really easily. Yes, and it looks like it's gotta, because unlike in a comedy where you've got Harold Ramis tightly in control of the anger, you're an angry audience looking at these elites, but he'll give you satisfaction. And you'll laugh at the humiliated hypocrites, and it'll be fine. Comedy is essentially anti-revolutionary. It calms down your anger by giving you these sorts of symbolic satisfactions. All the bad guys lose at the end of the comedy, even if you don't have solutions for the future. At least you can vent. And that's not going to happen in reality, where the anger is sort of fake on social media and sort of real, even on social media, and especially in a country where we're not really sure what the future is look like, but we don't really believe it's going to be good. That's not going in the right direction. And the less we believe it's going to go in the right direction, the more the crisis is going to deepen. We don't have solutions right now, but we can see that our elites are corrupt. And of course, that itself is dangerous, because if you don't believe in your elites, what next? We don't know. It's worth looking at one thing, however, popularity. For a comedy especially, popularity is the equivalent of voting. 
That's how you get consent and buy-in from your audience. These sorts of comedic stories that try to tell you do not invite demagogy and do not think you can shut it down or wish it away. Somewhat strange teachings to teach at the same time, but they're there. These sorts of things have a certain plausibility because of their popularity and now simply because of what we see in our politics. At some level, we actually do have to take popularity seriously as a criterion of judgment in the following sense. There's no way to run the people if you despise the people. At some level, the people have got to consent to the act of government in an active, not a passive way. Not simply by doing what it is that the party wants the electorate to vote for or to put up with. It's not as simple as that. You can't believe that the press or the social media or even the partisanship is going to get you voter buy-in and then you can do whatever the hell you want. That's not how it works. People have to learn again about popularity to search what is it that the people want that's good, that the country could live with and that can be done. And of course this to some extent is just beyond what even our better comic writers can write. But it is something that we will have to deal with in reality as our elite institutions lose not only popular support, but the technological ability to spread their names everywhere. Trump puts his name on everything. Well, you know, Trump ended up putting his name all over every TV channel and the TV channels were desperately glad to have him because that's where the money was. And now they hate him, but they still have to talk about him nonstop because that's where the money is. If Donald Trump disappeared, our whole media business model would collapse as well. That's a bad situation to be in, but that's the situation with our elites. They have become beholden to the man they hate. Change is coming and it's not going to be pretty. Well, also, I mean, at the end of the day, I think we, we could wrap it up on this, is that at the end of the day, they don't have to offer alternatives. On one level, it's enough not to live down to the mockery. In other words, you don't have to look at these movies and say, all oh, right, so who should be in charge? Because Zervik shouldn't be in charge and Fankman shouldn't be in charge. Well, you can look at these movies and say, don't act that way. Don't be as snobby. Don't be as thoughtless. Don't be as self-deceivingly naive. Don't be as cynical. You can try that. You can't be perfect, but you can try to do a little better in responding to criticism with self-righteous rage, especially the kind of self-righteous rage that is rooted in the understanding that the accusation is actually accurate in a lot of ways, that's what is self-defeating. It's a sense that we don't have to learn, and anybody who points out that the emperor is naked, they're a monster. Well, at the end of the day, if you're naked, you're naked, and it's going to get colder. Winter is coming, so you're going to have to learn, or it's only going to get worse. Yeah, demagogy and our social media craziness is a fire. Everybody with any ambition for public affairs at any level is going to have to go through it. There's no avoiding it. Well, Pete, thanks for joining me. This was a great idea to talk over, and I'm happy to have a chance to show just how much comic writers look at our society, at what's going on with our ideas about authority, and how they're trying to show this is what we should be paying attention to. This is not just a comic conceit. It's not just supposed to be funny. Of course, it's supposed to be funny, but it's also supposed to tell you, look at this clearly. You're laughing at it because you know it's true. And now we're not laughing anymore. <laughs> but we certainly have come to acknowledge, yep, it is true. We have a massive problem with institutional corruption of the elites. We'll see about what can be done, what can change. Thanks a lot, Pete. And let's talk again soon. My pleasure, Titus. Let's do this again. Bye.